Welcome to Raise Your Average. I'm Pierre Daly. My co-hosts are Mike Philbrick and Adam Butler, principals at Resolve Asset Management, SEZC. Our guest today is Eric Crittenden of Standpoint Asset Management based in Phoenix, Arizona. The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast are those of the individual guests and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of AdvisorAnalyst.com or of our guests. This broadcast is meant to be for informational purposes only. Nothing discussed in this broadcast is intended to be considered as advice. Welcome to the show. It's great to have you. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, guys, for having me. Appreciate it. Good to see you again. It's been a while. A couple of weeks. <laughs> Eric, I, I think for the benefit of those who don't know you, might be a good idea if you told us a little bit about the arc of your career, how you got into the uh, industry, and uh, what you're up to these days at Standpoint. Sure. Yeah. So my story uh, is a little similar to Adam. I was going to say I'm a weirdo, Adam, but I don't want to offend you. But, you know, our paths are <laughs> kind of similar. I, um, I'll i go all the way back to 1972, um, what the year I was born. So I grew up a military brat, which meant uh, I went to five different elementary schools, you know, three different junior highs, two different high schools, you know, moved around a lot. You know, I've lived on the West Coast, the East Coast, the Midwest, um, in fact, a funny story, I, I went to five different elementary schools, I think, and one in Seattle, one in, uh, or three in Tulsa, one in a tiny town in Kansas, and another one in Savannah, Georgia. And um, one of my earliest memories was learning three different versions of what led to the Civil War in the United States of America. Um, just completely uh, politically polarized stuff. So, you know, in, in Georgia, they taught me that the North invaded the South over taxes. In Seattle, it was uh, an altruistic invasion, you know, to stop slavery. And then in Kansas, I actually learned that the Civil War technically began in Kansas, which is actually technically true. So that, that was interesting. My point here, though, is um, from an early age, moving around, um, seeing things through different lenses, um, I think helped me form a healthy or maybe not quite healthy, but, um, a more prolific, uh, level of skepticism. And, and I think, um, encouraged me to develop some critical thinking skills that I otherwise wouldn't have developed. So I bounced around all over the place. I spent nine years in school, um, in college, um, changed my major five or six times. I started out in the sciences, things like meteorology. Uh, public health, um, oceanography, all kinds of stuff. Moved over to um, finance, fell in love with dynamic systems. Um, you know, I almost changed my major to computer science, but I was, I was getting gray hair even back then in the mid 90s. And I thought, all right, it's time to be an adult and go earn a paycheck. So I uh, graduated with a degree in finance, minor in computer science. Uh, my first job out of school, I was a teacher at an inner city junior college in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, my first day on the job, I showed up wearing a suit and tie, carrying a briefcase and the students were throwing stuff at me and it was just a zoo, chaos. I learned real quick that in order to get through to people that aren't particularly interested in what it is you're saying, you have to make it relevant to their life. You know, stories, uh, analogies, metaphors, and making it relevant to something that's going on in their life is the way to get through to people. And I hope that people recognize that and how Standpoint engages with clients is that we're really empathetic and we care about whether what we're doing is even relevant to your life. Is it solving any problems for you or not? So, and I think that that's a better terrain upon which to do business. So that's one thing that I hope you'll notice about Standpoint. Um, my job, next job after that, I went to work for a really big family office in Kansas, uh, started managing money, had a, a prop trading account, uh, that was November of 99. You guys know what happened after that. It was quite the experience, making a lot of money, losing money, um, seeing people go from being euphoric to total despair uh, and back and forth and seeing how it changes. Um, I, in other words, I got to do, get a PhD in investor psychology in real time, uh, kind of like some of the stories Adam's told in the past. Uh, eventually moved on. Um, loved, loved the people of Kansas. The weather's atrocious, though. So I moved to a sunny place, Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, started a, a small hedge fund with some capital from Tom Basso. You guys may know him. He was in the Market Wizards book. A nice guy, a local guy. Uh, he's actually the chairman of the board at, at Standpoint. But back then he wasn't. Um, he capitalized us to start a small hedge fund called Blackstar Funds. 
we achieved a little bit of notoriety. Uh, I wrote a paper a long time ago called Does Trend Following Work on Stocks? And a couple other papers that have a tiny cult following of weirdos like Adam, Mike, and myself that like this kind of stuff. Um, you know, had trouble raising uh, meaningful assets from this geographic location for a long short equity fund. Eventually uh, started another firm uh, or co-founded it called Longboard Asset Management, where we had a managed futures mutual fund, a long short equity mutual fund. Left that firm a couple of years ago, uh, recruited a team and started Standpoint with the, with the goal of solving some very specific problems that we think are meaningful in the marketplace. And here I am on this podcast today. Thanks, Eric. 50, 48 years, just like that. <laughs> Think of an eye, <laughs> wink of an eye. So I know you mentioned that we've sort of learned similar lessons along the way, but I think it's really neat to hear how you sort of frame the evolution of thinking, right? Because my understanding is that when you started out coming out of finance, maybe your impression was that in actual fact, people are seeking a most efficient portfolio, like from classic utility theory. And along the way, you kept trying to deliver that and eventually sort of realized that maybe most people actually don't want that. So maybe, maybe walk us through the evolution of that thinking and how you how, how your impression of what investors really want. Yeah, that's, that's a, it's a big topic, but it's an important one. So uh, I'll tell you a story. In, in college, there was a class that I took where uh, we had to write the code ourselves to um, implement modern portfolio theory. And um, I did that project and uh, I got a failing grade initially on it because I used too many asset classes. Um, the teacher really just wanted stocks, bonds, and real estate in there. Um, and being a, um, an engineering type thinker, you know, I overcomplicate everything. Um, so I did it even then I went out and got data on dozens of hedge fund indexes and all kinds of alternative assets. And I, I put them into, you know, the mean variance optimizer, um, that I wrote back in Pascal back in the mid nineties. Um, and it came up with, you know, a 35 to 45% allocation to something that, you know, we refer to today as systematic global macro or managed futures or trend or whatever you want to call it. Um, and the teacher didn't recognize it. And, um, and he said, the sharp ratio is way too high. The returns are too high. The volatility is too low. It's unrealistic. Um, you know, get, get rid of this thing and just do the assignment. So I went and whined to some of my other um, student friends and they're like, what's your problem? Just fix it and let's move on. Yeah, there was no curiosity. Um, nobody was curious as to why when I removed these alternative assets, the sharp ratio plummeted, the portfolio became much more fragile. Uh, it really struggled during periods of stagflation. It really struggled during periods of bear markets. Um, and I thought, aha, I'm going to show him the Delta. I'm going to show him like how much deterioration there is when you remove the alternative investments and he just no interest whatsoever, no curiosity. Uh, and that stuck with me. So, um, and that formed, you know, something in my mind that if, if you can go out into the marketplace and offer people an uncorrelated structural risk premium, something that's reliable, it's been around for decades, it's real, and it improves your sharp ratio, it improves the durability of your portfolio, it solves a whole bunch of problems that keep you up at night, um, that the marketplace will reward me. Nothing could be further from the truth. <laughs> so what I found is it's just a massive uphill battle to get people to do anything other than whatever has worked really well over the last one, three, and five years. And um, they'll consider alternative investments, but only during a period of time where they're clearly making money. That's the only time, right? So what I found, uh, and I did this for a long time, raised a lot of money, um, the hard way, you know, it's, it's definitely an uphill battle to get people to use alternatives, but found that the average investor, you know, nine out of 10 people can't stick with it. They can't hold the alts th through a full market cycle. Um, and that's a long conversation about cognitive psychology, behavioral finance as to the reasons why. And I used to have that conversation a lot with people, but what I found is that most people don't have time or interest to actually learn these things. They're just looking for solutions. Everyone's busy. So eventually I came up with, you know, I realized that what clients, advisors, individual investors actually want from me is the same thing that I do with my own money. 
they want what I characterize as an all weather approach. And that is a, a portfolio that's reasonably tax efficient, reasonably fee efficient, that's diversified enough such that it can survive and thrive in all the market environments that we've seen, seen since Jimmy Carter was president. That's my definition of Paul Weather. Other people will have their definition. So they can stick with it, um, but it can't be pure trend. It can't be pure anything that's, that's, that's completely uncorrelated with stocks and bonds. So I finally just decided to stop, you know, swimming upstream and try to get people to do things they don't want to do. Um, cause at the end of the day, if they want what I do with my own money, well, that's not hard for me to deliver. And obviously I believe in it. It makes a lot of sense. So standpoint was born. Um, and we're offering our version of what an all weather investment is. And, and we're going to find out if the marketplace agrees with me or not. So what, how do you define all weather in terms of how the portfolio? I don't, I don't uh, define it that way. I define it as, did it give me a reasonable risk reward? Um, in all the different market environments that I think are plausible going forward. So I generally start my research at the beginning of 1970. And I feel like from 1970 to current is a pretty robust sample of what you need to prepare for. Um, and if your investment methodology can't survive and thrive in all the market environments we've seen between 1970 and now, um, then I would say that you're probably unprepared for a very uncertain future. That's not perfect. We could get something very different from what we've seen from 1970 to now, but we can't be all knowing and all seeing. So I think that that's a very healthy uh, sample period that covers a lot of different plausible market environments. So if you come up with a set of rules and a discipline that can hang tough and hold its own in all of those market environments and it's scalable, meaning you could have implemented this strategy back then and you can handle several billion dollars today. That meets my definition of something that's all weather. So how did traditional portfolios of stocks and bonds do in the 1970s? I mean, very few people go back that far and examine the character of the portfolios that most people own during um, periods like you know, fr from 1970 to 1981, for example, what, what does that type of period look like? How did traditional portfolios perform and what other types of investments can people make that are complementary and can, and can help them to weather with this types of advice? I think there's a good reason that most people don't go back that far. Uh, there's a couple of good reasons. One, it, it, it's, it's prohibitively expensive and time consuming to get clean total return data from back then. Um, for alternative asset classes, it's not hard for stocks and bonds, but still people don't tend to go back that far. And it's because it paints a very dismal picture. That was a rough period of time, especially if you're looking at the returns and the drawdowns and the volatility in real terms. So the nominal returns were bad, but they weren't atrociously bad, but the real returns were atrociously bad because inflation was pretty rampant in the seventies and nominal returns were in the very low single digits. So your real returns were actually negative during that period of time. But really what happened that I think would throw a lot of people for a loop today is that stocks and bonds became positively correlated, strongly positively correlated in the seventies. And they both went down at the same time. So if we just, you know, rewind back to COVID, how would people have felt when their stocks were down 34, if their bonds were down 25 at the same time. That's the kind of market action you saw in the 1970s, not once, but multiple times during the decade. So if you look at the returns of popular asset classes in the 70s and you adjust them for inflation and fees, uh, there was a period of time where you had multiple 40, 50% uh, declines. Um, and it took 14 years to get back to break even. So if I asked someone today how they would feel about investing in a portfolio that could have them be underwater with a couple of 40 and 50% drawdowns, and it's, they have to wait 14 years just to get back to break even, I'm pretty sure nobody would, would volunteer, uh, to take that risk yet. I feel like that's what they're doing right now. So. Yeah, I would say that the numbers were pretty grim and that's why I like to add it because that period of time 
um, is plausible and realistic. And I think it's actually more probable going forward than the Goldilocks period, like the 1990s or the high growth period, like the 1980s. So I'm not saying that there's an 80% chance or anything like that. It's just that it's more probable than, because we haven't seen that kind of uh, struggle for a long time. Feels like it's overdue. And I feel like the you know governments and corporations, we've been doing everything we can to plant the seeds for stagflation for a long time now. We should not be surprised if it actually comes to fruition. So what worked? Yeah. So I was going to say, what, so what, what worked in the 1970s and how have you incorporated those themes into the portfolios that you... Well, one thing that um, most people will be familiar with that worked was gold. You know, gold, um, yeah, grains, uh, certain types of commodities did fantastically well. Um, but I'm not a big... I don't encourage people to go buy and hold commodities because I don't think commodities have a positive um, lifetime total return. So they just happen to do well during an inflationary period of time. Uh, um, there's a, uh, there's an asset class. Well, not everyone agrees it's an asset class, but I do called managed futures, uh, which is primarily trend following systematic trend following approaches to globally diversified portfolios of futures. So futures contracts on currencies, grains, metals, SOFs, energies, livestock, bonds, you name it. They've got just about everything. Um, those strategies, medium and long-term trend following approaches, which dominates the uh, managed futures industry, did phenomenally well, by and large, in the 1970s. Um, that's the kind of strategy that I think adds the most value. So if you're looking to diversify a 60-40 portfolio or any kind of a stock bond portfolio, you look around and you see things like private equity, um, venture capital, um, you know, convertible arbitrage, you, you see all these different alternatives. The problem with them is they all have the same structural risk underneath them. You know, it's a couple levels down, but when the shit hits the fan, um, they tend to all go down at the same time. You know, they're all taking the same uh, hidden structural risk. Uh, and there's only a few things in this world that tend to not go down when everything else is going down. Historically, or at least during our careers, it's been treasuries, but we already talked about how that didn't work out in the 1970s. So it's not always treasuries. It depends upon the market environment. Sometimes gold really pays off when you need it to. Sometimes it doesn't. Again, it depends on the market environment. Systematic trend following the managed future space has, in my opinion, been more effective at diversifying you when you need it the most, when everything's going down, more so than any other asset or asset class that I've seen. So it's it's very um, surprising and strange to me that more people don't recognize this. Uh, and the ones that do recognize it and implement managed futures can't hold it through a full market cycle. So that's the problem that I'm trying to solve. And I think even you guys um, comment on that's the you know, that, that's, that's the main problem in the marketplace, that if anyone can solve it, they would be, you know, very rich. So, the, Eric, the, the, the period of time that Im immediately preceded this sort of horrific 1970s um, market where, where equities and bonds both went down together, um, both were positively correlated and negative in terms of returns, the, the period immediately preceding that was the period that's commonly referred to as the nifty 50 period, right? Where, where you had high flying stocks that you couldn't lose money on, mm -hmm. so to speak. That, so are we not in a similar kind of a, um, mindset right now or like, or like the end of the sixties and er, very early seventies, um, it, it's almost parallel, isn't it? I mean, it, it, it has a, a similar sort of feel to it. I mean, people are at the point in terms of sentiment where, you know, there's this, there's no alternative sentiment about stocks, about risky assets, and they're really not, re they're not really paying attention to, uh, commodities as they should be right now. Right. Yeah. I would say that's a very astute observation that I don't hear very often. There are some strong similarities between the late sixties and what we've seen over the past few years. And not just in terms of a small number of mega corporation dominating the indexes, um, you know, fear of deflation, uh, stocks and bonds having done well, uh, for a long period of time, social unrest, um, 
you know, there, there, there's all kinds of parallels between then and now. It's almost um, eerie to the point where you, you almost want to say, well, it's going to be very, it's got to be different this time. Uh, but yeah, there are very strong parallels. Now, I will say that the 60s, I mean, the data in the 70s is tough enough to deal with. Um, you know, I, I have a philosophy that I won't implement a strategy today that I couldn't have implemented in basically the same form back in the 70s. I'm not passing judgment on anyone who says that, no, I, that that's too far, that's too much, Eric. Um, but that's the way I like it. I like to test what I trade and trade what I test. And I like using rules that are the same as what I would have used, you know, the year I was born, 1972. Because I believe that there are structural risk premium in the markets that you can earn that, that are there, um, that allows me to sleep at night. So... Uh, when I look at the 1970s and this, but if you go back into the 1960s, there was a lot of government intervention, you know, price ceilings, subsidies, price floors, all kinds of stuff. Um, so I don't really trust the data from the 60s uh, back to about World War II. There were a lot of times when the exchanges were shut down and whatnot. So that's one of the reasons you'll see all, all of my research generally begin uh, in 1970, because that's when I think markets were actually tradable with these approaches that we use today. Yeah. I mean, the parallels aren't just in the markets, are they? <laughs> no, it's across the board. It's eerie. socially and historically like the, the sentiment, you know, the sort of hippie generation, there's, there's a lot of similarity. There's a lot of similarities to today. Right. I mean, in terms of uh, the, the overriding, like the socioeconomic sentiment, not just the economic sentiment. Well, even on the technological side, you know, it's kind of, you know, we scoff at that, uh, the idea that a washing machine or a microwave is, you know, as important as, you know, semiconductors and microprocessors and whatnot. But at the time it was, it was a huge deal. It liberated millions of people to actually have a life because they didn't, weren't using a, a, a scrubbing board to wash their clothes. You know, I mean, the, there was a lot of change mm -hmm. that happened after the Korean War. And people got refrigerators rather than ice boxes. They got washing machines, dishwashers. I mean, it changed the lifestyles of virtually everyone in America in a very short period of time. So you now we look at today and say, well, we have Instagram, we have cell phones, we have the internet. Um, and yeah, you know, it's a little chronocentricity going on right there. We, th we think whatever's happening during our, you know, while we're paying attention is so much more important. But when you go back historically, the, the invention of the telegraph was actually a bigger sea change than the internet. And I would argue that a lot of the technology that rolled out in the mid and late sixties changed the world more, even more so than what we're seeing today. So, but, but again, right. another parallel right. technology. And, and, and the nifty 50 was, you know, Eastman Kodak, Infosys, things like, um, uh, some other te tech ish names at the time that were sort of revolutionary. And you overlay that with the, uh, baby boomers coming of age in, uh, childbearing uh, working through the process of, uh, building a home, buying that, uh, going from a, an ice box to a refrigerator, a television, a color television, many color TVs. And, um, and that you lay that across again, the millennials, the next largest or the soon to be largest demographic now coming into childbearing years, filling their homes, uh, technology becoming the sort of zeitgeist at the moment to, uh, place, you know, infinite valuations on because they can always grow into those valuations. Um, there's a lot of neat stuff that, that sort of rhymes, uh, as usual. And then here we are sitting in this moment in time. If we look back to sort of late last year and have seen the, uh, post the COVID, you know, negative price oil contract for a moment in time. Right. So. It's a pretty significant potential um, bottom or potential shelling point to look as a bottom for the next uh, next major trend in, let's say, energies or commodities in general. And it's it's interesting to watch the the zeitgeist of of the population or the Overton window, if you will, pass over commodities from oh, it's a drag in my portfolio, I don't need it in sixty forty to where we sit today, where there is a much broader awareness. Um, probably stemming from obviously the, the returns, uh, dwarfing those in stocks and bonds over the last call it six months to a year. Um, but how, how far do you think, uh, Eric, we're in that, that sort of sea change of adoption? It, it would seem to me that we're 
you know, still at the very tip of that spear, but are, are you seeing mass adoption across the board in, in these other assets in a true multi-asset portfolio, or are you just, are you seeing sort of initial conversations coming your way and those initial educational conversations of, you know, why it should be included? It should be included always, but since it wasn't included, you should start getting it included. No, I'm not seeing much adoption at all. Um, that's why I'm so enthusiastic going forward is that the, the marketplace hasn't been penetrated at all. In fact, people have been moving away from alternatives. Um, and you guys have been around the block even more times than I have. So, you know, what happens when everyone moves away from something, I think last November was the seat change of, of sentiment where people just gave up on virtually all forms of alternatives. And now they're, now they're working again. Um, so yeah, I would say that there's been very little uptake and standpoint is an attempt to deliver valuable diversification um to give you a durable portfolio that i think can handle really hostile market environments while at the same time you know hang tough during the good times too which is really what people want i mean people can be reasonable um you know we just we don't frame our arguments that way in this industry i think we just do a bad job in this industry of empowering people to be reasonable because we focus too much on the how and not enough on the on the why and the what so before we go too deep into this topic there's a question i've been wanting to ask you guys about because you brought up the 1970s and it seems like it's the perfect time um there's a guy mike green over at simplify he's one of the only people that brings up this concept of uh, economic growth um, isn't, isn't always enough to save you. I mean, the seventies had plenty of economic growth. The demand curve yep. blew out. Um, you know, there was all kinds of stuff going on economically, and that didn't mean that your stock and bond portfolios did well, they did really bad. So what do you guys think about that concept? Because I hear it all the time. They're like, well, when the economic growth come, comes back, well, not necessarily. Yeah. Uh, I think there's, there's a couple of dynamics there. I'll, I'll, I'll take a guess at a narrative. Why not? First of all, you had the initial sort of conditions, the starting place for stocks price-wise was very high. Then you had the um, uh, inflation driven by the lack of labor, which turned into wage inflation, which combined with input inflation. And in the face of those two waves of cost increases, profit margins for companies had a difficult time overcoming that based on the starting place of the valuations of equities, i.e., you know, you were at such lofty valuations, you had brought so much of the potential future returns into today in 1969, let's say, that even though there was profit and productivity increases, um, those valuations uh, expected them to be even more. And thus you had this um, lack of, of growth that turned into stock price increases I also think that inflation structurally tends to lead to higher correlations between stocks and bonds. So when you get inflation coming through asset prices, that is something that creates that structural correlation for stocks and bonds. And thus they move together and the efficient frontier becomes just a straight line rather than having any sort of curve to it. So that would be my guess. Um, but I, you know, I'm, I'm probably wrong. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, uh, what, what life brings to the discussion is the idea that, um, who preceded Paul Volcker in the 1970s as Fed chairman? Do you remember? Oh, he was whoever it was. I don't. And Volcker both perceived inflation as a monetary phenomenon when in reality it was just the economy absorbing a huge, it's sort of the pig in the python type of concept from a demographic standpoint. So you've got a huge cohort coming of age and moving into a phase of household formation and looking for work. And this is, there was this major growth and demand surge and, um, the central bankers observed that inflation and said, oh, the only thing I know how to do in response to perceived inf or observed inflation is raise rates. But when you raise rates, you raise the cost of capital and you raise the hurdle rate for investment. And how do you accommodate a surge in demand 
if you are truncating the supply response by limiting investment capital. And so you had this, um, you know, massive demand surge met with po policy response of limited the expansion of supply. And so that's what led to this. Yeah. And so you've got, you've got a huge surge in real rates. A, a surge in real rates is, is bad for investment and it also is bad for uh, valuations, equity valuations. So you've got sort of valuation compression. You've got cost push inflation. You've got labor inflation. So you've got margin compression in the corporate sector. You've got all these things kind of converging to um, to deliver poor real realized returns to equities and bonds. So a couple of different ways to triangulate on that uh, situation. Um, the interesting thing there is th there's one other point I've actually wanted to um, touch base or bounce this off of uh, Mike Green as well on this particular topic, because he does have this position that, um, you know, Volcker was wrong and he should have, we should have provided more liquidity to provide more growth, kept rates lower. The challenge is the U S just went off the gold standard in 1971 and needed to establish the U S dollar as the preeminent global currency. And thus had they just printed money in order to facilitate growth in the economy, that would have had some Im implications for the U.S. dollar being the global currency. And so I think there's kind of a couple of things at play there that may not have allowed someone like Volcker to take a, an accommodative stance, given the fact that we had just left the, the gold standard for the U.S. dollar, which had made it the default global currency. So that, that, that's a really difficult sort of um, time, period of time to, to sort of recreate what the potential implications were for all these forces going on. Um, and I think there was definitely, there would have been a challenge for Volcker to say, oh no, we've got growth and we should just be accommodative um, globally. What would um, other currencies or other countries around the world looking to the U.S. as being the, you know, sort of default currency of the world, what would they have thought? And how might they have impacted the price of the dollar? It's a good point. Um, unintended consequences, they're everywhere, right? And it's easy to be a Monday morning quarterback. Um, and you, you can get away with that in economics, but in asset management, you can't, so. <laughs> yeah, which, which is really why, I mean, I, I think Adam, you say this very well, a portfolio is, is really a series of hedges against different potential outcomes. They're different structural outcomes where you, you're honestly saying, well, I don't know. And if I don't know, well, if, if we, if we could all admit to ourselves that we didn't know the future in the domain of investing, what portfolio would we hold? I always phrase the question like that is because no one seems to be able to admit to themselves that they don't have some sort of future view when it comes to the portfolio. Point actually, and, and which leans back. I've got a really acute and salient example of that because of course we just, we just moved country about a year ago, and in doing so, we sold our primary residence. And what I didn't re realize at the time was that that left me short a an important uh, cost sleeve over the course of my life, right? Which is you've always got to have a place to live. And um, so, you know, just thinking about your investments as hedging against all of the potential sources of inflation in the areas of the economy that you need to, you need to, to, to get resources from, um, it is a really constructive way to think about putting a portfolio together, um, and offers a good sort of segue. Cause I, I did want to, so much of the conversation about what the right portfolio is. Um, it's not about what you should hold, but rather in what, how you should weight those different pieces, right? So I think we've acknowledged that there's investors kind of want to keep up when times are good. Also acknowledging that there's a lot of unknowns out there. And some of those unknowns are, or have historically been, and should probably be expected to be going forward, harmful to the portfolios that, that most people currently own. And there are answers to that, which hedge against those types of risks. How do you weigh that in, in putting a portfolio together to make sure that investors have the hedges and proper bets in place, um, but can also 
manage the emotional roller coaster that comes from uh, being not 100% invested in stocks when things are going well. Yeah, I'm, I think it might be too much of an ask, actually. I don't think you can take it that far without getting what I call too cute. Um, so, I mean, obviously you want to do that. You want to put yourself and your investors in a position to have a smooth ride in a way that's responsible, in a way that still deserves to collect a risk premium over time. And the only way to do that safely, in my opinion, is through effective diversification. Um, most people in our industry try to do it through uh, timing models and rules and, you know, curve fitting and all kinds of, you know, interesting things. And some of them will be successful. Most of them won't. Um, but I think you guys will agree that the safest way to do that is to mix uh, fundamentally different assets together into a portfolio. And then be honest with yourself about how often you should change the weightings, uh, which you can learn empirically by looking at turnover, taxes, transaction costs, and then you can, you can reconcile that against your real life experience. So it, it's, it's not that complicated. I, I feel like we in our industry overcomplicate everything when really it's just not that hard to put together some things that's approaching an all weather portfolio that's got reasonable taxes, reasonable fees and reasonable returns that if presented to potential investors the right way, um, would penetrate the market and, and they would, uh, they'd be happy with it. So I know where you're going though. And that is, um, if you, you know, there's a lot of people that haven't kept up with the stock market, um, in the last, you know, three to 10 years that are actually doing really good work. They're doing good and important work uh, and they have not kept up with the stock market and they're getting kicked in the face for that. Um, I guess my point is that if they took that good work and they were to merge it into a portfolio of risk assets and offered that to clients, then they wouldn't be getting kicked in the face and they'd have a lot more assets under management and the clients would have a lot more alts in their portfolio. That's my hypothesis. What does that look like in practice? Yeah, I mean, what, Can you what elaborate? Is how, how, how have you constructed the portfolio to represent that balance? Right. Okay. So um, I did everything empirically because these decisions were made before the decision to like frame the marketing that way. So my goal was to build something that I think has the highest probability of being able to survive and thrive no matter what the market throws it at us going forward. But it also means you have to make money when stocks are going up because stocks are the, are the performance driver. I mean, they're the engine, you know, it's, it's, I don't believe that you're going to be compounding at eight, 10, 12% a year. If GDP is going backwards, you know, I don't believe in the magical alpha that you can get ahead, uh, in a negative sum game with a, with a contracting GDP. Some people will, it's just a bad expectation. So, um, when I sat down to build what I think is the optimal portfolio, and I use the word optimal differently than other people, I'm not talking about the highest return. I'm not even talking about the highest risk adjusted return in conventional, uh, terms. I'm, it's the highest risk adjusted return by my criteria. And I recognize a lot of risks that don't show up in the quantitative data, meaning like we don't have the great depression from 1970 to current, we don't have confiscation. We don't have exchange closures, right? So it's, it can't just be purely quantitative. There's a qualitative act aspect to me, you know, signing off on, on an investment philosophy. So, um, it helps that if you just take any intellectually honest managed futures, global trend index, and you go back as far as you can, and you mix that with, uh, various different asset classes, corporate bonds, gold, market cap weighted equities, equal weighted equities. Um, different arbitrage strategies. You can just take all of them. You know, I think Meb Faber has a giant spreadsheet that he sells to people that's got like 90 different asset classes in there. So you can take all those asset classes and you can write a little algorithm that says, show me every single pair, uh, every triangle, every quad, every single combination you can come up with and show me which ones were best. It's really hard to come up with something that's better than a 50, 50 split between global equities and managed futures. Really hard. And then when you can come up with something, cause you can do it, uh, when you go under the hood and look at it and go, this is going to be a nightmare to manage, there's going to be taxes, 
all kinds of corporate actions to deal with uh, illiquid, illiquidity issues, scalability issues. So if you strip away those things, you give up a tiny bit of the return, the volatility goes up a tiny bit, but now you have something that's scalable, it's explainable, it's tax efficient, uh, and it can hold its own in all the market environments that I'm particularly worried about. So uh, for me, it was building, um, right, so I don't know if that's a good answer, but it's an honest answer of, I wanted something that had the highest return to my definition of risk ratio consistently from 1970 to current. And for me, that was basically equal risk contribution from managed futures and global equities, market cap weighted, just pure equity beta. And how do, how do bonds play a role in that both historically? And then as you look at current yields versus future expectations. So that's interesting. Um, on the surface, bonds look like a fantastic diversifier. They've had an amazing run um, from 1983 to current. They're on a risk adjusted basis, one of the best performing asset classes out there. Um, they're not tax efficient. Uh, you know, you're paying ordinary income on most of that return. I mean, there's some capital gains along the way, um, but generally speaking, you should just expect ordinary income. So on an inflation adjusted, tax adjusted basis, bonds lose quite a bit of their luster. Um, in fact, if you add on advisory fees, inflation, taxes, I think the 10 year treasury actually, you're going to find this hard to believe, but it's true. I think the 10 year treasury actually has a negative, uh, real return after, uh, transaction costs, uh, taxes and advisory fees and everything, even though it had a 7% nominal return at first glance, if you scratch everything else out, I think it's right around a little under zero. Uh, since, since 1970. So, um, how do bonds fit in? I, I don't, I don't like bonds. Um, I view them as a market of last resort. So I like the trend following on the different asset or the different sectors and futures, grains, commodities, uh, metals, so on and so forth. Um, obviously I like my equities, so I'm going to own them. Um, but that leaves, you know, a pool of capital left over. T typically for us, it's about 30% of the AUM, um, 35% is left over. So with that, I'm going to go get the risk-free rate of return. So I'm going to do a laddered uh, treasury bond portfolio up to one year duration. And the goal there is just collect the risk-free rate of return, whatever it is, um, because you're not going to deploy that capital anyways. So, and then, but the bonds are actually in the trend following portfolio. So, you know, we're, very short bonds right now all around the globe. So uh, sometimes we're long, sometimes we're short. It all depends. But I don't view them as uh, a permanent asset class in our all-weather portfolio, other than the fact that they're in there for the risk-free rate of return. I had a couple package. of different directions I wanted to cover. Oh, sorry, Mike, if you wanted to close the loop on this. Gotcha. I... No? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, go ahead. It's to go ahead. Yeah. how a multi-asset or how multi-asset funds are perceived by advisors. Um, I mean, we also obviously I've been running multi-asset funds for many years. And one of the objections that we get is that advisors feel it's their role to set the asset allocation policy in portfolios. And so layering in a multi-asset fund sort of conflates the role of the um, investment manager with the role of the advisor. So kind of curious how you um, how you speak to that, to advisors. And then you've got a good story about how to best communicate the value of this type of approach too, which involves asking investors to, to sort of select or what they prefer, which I want to get into, but let's start with how you communicate the value of your multi-asset, um, approach to advisors who may feel like you're encroaching on their domain. Yeah, that's a good point in question. In fact, it was a buzzsaw that we ran into right out of the gate. And it's like, well, where do I put this thing? And isn't it my job to put portfolios together? Like if, if what you're saying is true, I should go find the best managed futures manager and the best equity manager and put them together, right? So that's common. Um, and then you got to be diplomatic about this. And I think we're pretty decent at being diplomatic about it. Ask them, well, how much how much alt, alt exposure do you actually have in your portfolio? And generally the answer is zero to 5%. 
And then you ask them, well, is that enough to actually make a difference um, in your time of need? And the answer is always, well, no, it's definitely not enough. All right. So, so, and then you just, if we fast forward to the other question you had about demonstrating the, the value, um, it's indisputable. You can see clearly that if you have enough managed features in your portfolio, it's a much nicer uh, experience. If it's in the portfolio, if it's integrated in and you look at the portfolio level results, I've yet to have a single person tell me, I don't like that. That's unacceptable. They all say, wow, that is a nice, smooth equity curve. I really, if that had been my experience, I'd be a very popular advisor. And I don't have, I don't have any clients that would have, would have, you know, been upset with that experience. How, how do I do that? Well, it's, well, you got to put 50% of your money in managed futures. How many of you going to do that? Zero. Why? Well, it's the same thing that, you know, we've been talking about forever. And that is you can't, they can't have things in the portfolio that can be down when the stock market's up for more than, you know, a couple quarters. Uh, it just causes so much psychological trauma for clients. In other words, clients don't actually like diversification in real time. Uh, they like, they kind of like it if the alternative is up and the stock market is down, they still don't like the whole overall, but when the alt is down and the stock market is up, you just can't overcome that. So it just turns into career risk, uh, for advisors and they can't hold that. Now I've created a whole bunch of different, um, experiments where I anonymize asset classes and I mix asset classes together and I don't tell people what they are. I just color code them. And I ask them to, to take a look at the results. You know, usually it's annual returns. Uh, sometimes I go back to the eighties. Sometimes I go back to 2000. It depends on the audience. Um, and well over 90% of the time, uh, people choose the portfolio that's got 50% managed futures. They don't choose the stock bond portfolio. They don't choose stocks. Sometimes they choose bonds by themselves because it has no volatility. Um, but more than nine times out of 10, in my experience, they choose that what I refer to as the all weather portfolio. And then when I reveal to them that that's what they chose, they're absolutely perplexed. And they say, well, I tried using managed futures years ago and I had a 5% allocation. It was an absolute nightmare. Um, so they can't do it. So it's just a way of demonstrating value in a way that's counterintuitive and, and it forces people to kind of, re, you know, face their cognitive dissonance. If you want to do something different than 60, 40, every piece of research that I've ever seen that I trust basically says managed futures is the best diversifier in the world and has been for 50 years. So that's what you're looking for. Now, when you implement it, it causes all kinds of problems that you say, I don't want anything to do with that. I get it. Um, and I'm not recommended that people go out and buy pure managed futures for that very reason. However, if you want something that has the full benefits of having enough managed futures. Well, you're going to start to see, I think, more of these all weather style products hit the marketplace because they actually solve that's a, the problems that people are complaining about. That's a, that's, that's a real strong common thread in, in a lot of conversations we're having, which is this line item risk. Uh, you know, whether it's discussing the line items with your clients or, or the career risk that comes with having those line items. And, and, and sort of, you know, trying to cloak them, we're trying to cloak them out in your discussion so that they don't become the focal point that, that, that seems unavoidable that, that, that the line items that are diversifiers, uh, at, at the times when they're the negative items, that seems to be a real focal point for, for retail investors and, and advisors in, in general. Well, to drive that, to drive that point home, I created another experiment, um, where, well, first, first thing, my business mentality is it, all of this is my fault. It's not the advisor's fault. It's not the client's fault. Every single bit of it is my fault because I have the power to, to deliver, I to repackage, reformat in a way that makes smiles rather than frowns. So that's what I intend to do. But in order to drive the point home, I had another experiment where I would show people, um, you know, the, the, the alternative right next to the stocks. Uh, and ask them how, you know, could I get you to make a 5% allocation to this? Look how great it is. Uh, and they always do the same thing. They scroll down and then they see a year where the stock market's up and the alt's down and they go, oof. And then they scroll down. If they see one more or two more of those, it's game over. And they say, no, no, I, I, I have 400 phone calls that year from clients. It's, I can't do it. Right. So then I trick them um, and I just blend the two together and put it in the third column. Right. And I say, well, what about this? Um, and they scroll down and most of them, the overwhelming majority of them say, well, that's, that, that's what I'm talking about. That's a lot better. That would be a lot easier. 
Um, if that's not something crazy, I could see myself using it, right? So, but here's where it gets interesting. So I was asking him to do a 5% allocation to the pure alt and the answer is no, no, no. Then I do a 50-50 blend, don't tell him what it is. And I say, how about a 10% allocation to this? And the answer is yes, yes, yes. But mathematically, they're the same thing. There's no difference except the line item risk is gone. So I, so I'll, I'll challenge the, the, the usage of the, the phrase, you know, hiding it or, you know, adding sugar, or these, these kind of, um, what I think are negative connotation phrases to describe this phenomenon. I view it as just don't shove people's faces in it, you know, like just build a good portfolio, solve problems rather than creating new ones. And that's what I'm trying to do. So I hope that resonates and makes sense to you guys. Well, I, th I think there's also a, there's the institutional side of the way you're going to conduct the rebalancing too, that sort of ensures the, the full weight of the potential diversity in the portfolio and the professional way in which you're going to rebalance as though it's Groundhog Day relentlessly, um, is going to provide those ex extra returns rather than the typical approach, which is I adopt alternatives. It works for a little while. It doesn't work. I give up. I sell, which then realizes the negative risk premium at that point in time, crystallizes it, locking it in so that the investor ends up getting the risk and not the return. And so whatever we can do to enhance the an investor's opportunity to actually stick to the plan and then as professional money managers also hit the button at the appropriate times when it's really hard, when most won't, to actually rebalance to capture those returns is... Yeah, I think... Well, whatever, you, you, whatever you do, I mean, the conviction level has to be so, I mean, it has to be extremely high in order to be able to stick to it. I'm just listening to what you just said, Mike, which is that, which is that, you know, like an advisor or an investor could try, you know, getting into these diversifiers and then when they don't do well, they get out of them and they make, they, they deliver all the risk to the, to the client instead of, instead of mitigating it, they end up delivering it. And, and so like in order to make that leap into this all weather framework, you really have to buy into it solidly before you actually take that first step forward. I think it, you really can't be in it halfway, just like, you know, you can't be half pregnant. Uh, you know, you really can't be into this, you know, for me, it's been a learning, it's been a real education, uh, you know, getting to know what, what Mike and Rodrigo and Adam are doing at Resolve and, and you really can't do it halfway. You can't do any of this stuff halfway. You really have to be like the whole hog has to be in there and you really have to, you really have to stick to it. You can't, as soon as you, as soon as you waver on it, you know, that's where things, that's where it would fall apart. I think, I mean, I'm just listening, listening to what you're saying, Mike, about abandoning, uh, abandoning ship at the first sign of trouble. I could see that happening. I could see where, where if the conviction level wasn't there, you, you really taking, you really run that risk of, of, of delivering risk instead of mitigating it. Well, sadly that the time at which you're, you're eliminating the position is the time that you should be rebalancing and leveling out the positions in order that you are taking advantage of the opportunity that comes from non-correlated sort of structures and sources of return. And thinking about, as Eric puts in his portfolio, you've got global stocks and managed features that those are, those operate, those operate on very different, uh, sort of timetables with respect to delivering excess return. And so you need to do the rebalance in order to really amplify that. Yeah. And oftentimes it's missed. I would say that uh, cyclicality and dispersion is the enemy of um, investor psychology. So anything you can do to reduce the, I would say, exaggerated cyclicality and dispersion um, empowers the clients to not be their own worst enemy. Because um, keep in mind, it's real hard for us to, to be empathetic because we're not the client. Um, you know, when I go to the dentist, I don't want him or her to explain, you know, every single detail of what they're going to do. I just want them to do a good job, charge me a fair price. 
It's the same thing with our clients, right? But when you give them a whole bunch of dispersion and you maximize the cyclicality of the line items, it just triggers all kinds of emotions um, that result in negative, you know, investor-weighted returns over time. I mean, you can, I've done this exper these different experience experiments many times, and it's like if you package it up one way, it never gives them the reason to sell. If you disaggregate it and, and create in, in individual line items, it gives them dozens of reasons to sell and buy and chase and just creates excitement where there doesn't need to be any. You know, one of our philosophies is we will bore you to success <laughs> rather than excite you, excite you to death. Um, um, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, you better run out of trace on that. What are the things that, <laughs> you should. What are the things that um, a good friend of mine who works as an institutional, like a pension consultant, always raises is it seems like the portfolio that you put together, which is very close thematically to the way that we approach things as well, um, should be the core, right? I mean, you've given thought to how the optimal portfolio should be. And, and you've given not just the optimal portfolio in terms of maximizing the long-term sharp ratio or, you know, some sort of quantitative objective, but also, you know, on the Pareto frontier that includes um, tracking her and the desire of people to keep up with stocks when stocks are doing well. Like you've incorporated, you've built this portfolio for people to stick with. It can be mm -hmm. a core hold it. Like in theory, this could be the only line item in a person's portfolio. And that would be perfectly coherent. How do you position this as a, as, as some small complementary line item in a portfolio relative to, you know, other holdings when in fact the the portfolio itself really should be thought of as core. Yeah, I, you know, I don't get caught up in that debate. Um, people always ask me that question. And my, my answer always is, um, my job is to manage this portfolio as best I can and create a survivor. I worry about taxes, fees, and keeping up with, you know, whatever's working over, you know, the next 20 to 30 years. How you want to use it in your portfolio, it's up to you. If you want to make a 5% allocation, I'm more than happy to do the work for you every day. If you want to make it 50% of your portfolio, that's fine. I mean, I wouldn't take that kind of individual manager risk. Um, I wouldn't recommend that to anyone, but you're right. If somebody looks at it and I won't be the least bit surprised if 10 years from now, people are looking at uh, this type of an all weather approach and saying, you know, that's 25, 35% of my portfolio. It's a hundred percent of my portfolio. So I have no desire for anything else other than maybe a piece of real estate someday, but no, it's, it is, it is my core holding and I wouldn't begrudge anybody who made it their core holding. I, but you got to start somewhere. And uh, because it is a little bit different than what's um, uh, pervasive in the industry right now, you got to start with two, five, 10% allocations to begin with and happy if they stay there. I'm, I'm just trying to provide a valuable service to people, not dictate to them, you know, whether it's a core or a satellite or whether it's an alt. Um, I do get the question a lot. Obviously, I don't have a great answer. It's um, little, I don't, I don't have a good answer. Ask again in three years, I might have the question. And that's why I asked you, because I'm wondering if maybe you can, you can help out. But I also wanted to know, I mean, what we, we sort of assume people want steady returns that are, that also have a strong likelihood of keeping up with stocks when stocks are doing well. And, but in reality, I think what many people want is a portfolio that can maximize their distributable income, right? And, and that is a function, not just of the average returns, but also the path that those returns travel through time, right? And so do you have any, have you done any work hmm. or have any thoughts on how a portfolio like what you um, manage can, can do to improve that objective? Yeah. So anytime you, you get rid of the cyclicality to, to the degree that a 50% allocation to managed futures does, 
um, you really almost exponentially reduce the sequence risk, the permutation risk. And that's very, very relevant. It's never been more relevant to retirees than it is right now. Um, I haven't put a lot of time and effort into integrating that message into the messaging, right? Um, I probably will do that at some point. It's just, you got to keep it simple in the beginning. You know, get market share, get established, generate trust and credibility before you overwhelm people with a whole bunch of um, metrics. And because that's a complex topic um, and it gets people excited, but then they realize, oh, my goodness, I'm going to have to explain this to my clients. And it's such a nightmare and it's only for a two to five percent allocation. So I love it. It's it's very, very relevant. Uh, it deserves um, to be in the discussion. But from a business perspective, I'm putting that on the back burner. Um, for like year three and four uh, before hitting people with that. But it definitely, in my opinion, bonds don't solve that problem anymore. Um, equities clearly don't solve that problem. And what else do you have? Well, as I look around at all the other um, potential asset classes, most of them have that same structural risk as equities. You know, when, when times are really tough, it's just managed futures. It's global trend is the one that historically has stood up and paid off when you need it the most. And it's real simple to integrate in. And I feel like I have a way to deliver it to people in a way that won't drive them or their clients crazy. So I'm just going to focus on that for now and worry about the complexity of the marketing message later on. We spent a lot of time early on because it's, it's one of these things where you want to keep it simple. And so the safe withdrawal rate is just as simple as the expected annualized rate of return at the expected annualized sharp ratio. And in fact, it's more, it's a more practical measure um, in many ways and speaks more directly to what many clients are actually after, right? And if it's not the safe withdrawal rate, then some close facsimile to that. Um, but, you know, it's you just never know what's, what's going to resonate. We, we definitely had some success in helping that sort of helps us communicate the potential advantages of, of these types of approaches. But as you say, it can also complicate the conversation since it's not something that advisors are used to discussing with managers. And it's not even something that investors are used to discussing with advisors, really. So it's, it's something fundamental and practical, but unfamiliar. Well, to be clear, I think you guys are in a position to make that argument because, you know, you've been around for a long time. Um, you've already established trust and credibility and you have institutional business. So I would strongly encourage you to uh, put some effort into uh, creating some sort of a simple marketing message that, that illustrates that because it's great opportunity. Uh, in the life cycle of standpoint, we're coming up on the one and a half year mark. Um, you know, we, we, we can't command... Um, the people's attention to sit down and do a bunch of homework on our behalf yet. We'll get there, but we're not there yet. Makes sense. Cool. What are, what are um, uh, any questions that you get relatively frequently coming in from either advisors or investors that we haven't covered today? What's, you know, you're, you're sitting there standpoint, you're, you know, managing money, uh, working with advisors to get allocations. And what are, what are the main points of education that we may not have covered thus far? If we have, then fine. But anything we've missed broadly that, that you're getting some feedback on? Not really. Um, I'm sure there's a few things, but nothing really jumps out. Um, you guys have a pretty good, I mean, cause we're doing kind of the same thing. So I get the same questions you guys get. I mean, recently it's more of, um, you know, under the hood, like what do you actually do on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, and I wouldn't say that that's typical, but that's what I've been getting recently. Uh, they want to know, like, structurally, what do you do? What do you do on Wednesday? What do you do at eight in the morning? You know, what do you do at seven o'clock at night? Um, how do you do this? How do you buy gold? Is this, what is it? Gold futures? What do they represent? Is it deliverable? You know, stuff like that. So nuts and bolts, kind of blocking and tackling stuff. Um, you guys brought up the, where do I put it in the portfolio? What do I pull from? Yeah, that's a I mean, we get that question a lot. It's like, should should I pull from equity? Should I pull from bond? Should I pull from other alternatives? Um, and you know, it's situational. It's like, well, what problem are you trying to solve? Um, do you have too much equities? 
because there's your answer. Do you have too much bonds? There's your answer. Do you have a bunch of alts that are causing all kinds of problems and they're, they've got a 3% annualized return and a 2% fee? Well, there's your problem. So it's very situational, but we help people, you know, we, we tell them the truth, you know, we, we, we encourage any and all kinds of questions, tell them the truth and then trust them to, to make a decision. Um, it's a lot easier when you're offering an all weather product, um, that isn't an eyesore the same way that a pure alts product is when it's out of favor. Do you ever, do, do you ever, and any, like uh, Eric, um, like how do you overcome, I, I maybe, I, I'm not sure if we talked about it already, but, um, I think one of the big issues that's coming up about, you know, the decumulation phase of, of, uh, you know, the biggest asset holders lives, uh, retirement, um, and the, the idea of sequence of returns risk, how does the all weather portfolio, like it, 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 I understand long-term that the all weather portfolio is meant to mitigate a lot of these, uh, you know, risks that are going to occur potentially from a change in regime in the market, but how does it work when it comes to overcoming or mitigating sequence of returns risk for, for retirees? I mean, I, I thought, I just thought of the question since we were on the subject of, of the, uh, you know, where do you draw from? Where do you, where do you draw income from? Um, typically the worst time to be faced with this issue is, is when the market's in a drawdown and, and you, your investors need their income. Um, so how does the all weather approach, uh, deal with that? You know, I'm going to ask Adam and Mike to chime in on that and maybe do a little translation. Just want to make sure I understand the question. Yeah. I mean, what I, do you guys I think? I think we, I think you actually answered this question very directly, right? That the all weather portfolio is specifically designed to, um, dramatically reduce the sequence of returns risk. Um, especially sustained during sustained periods of either, you know, higher than normal inflation and or higher than normal disinflation or deflation or, or lower than expected growth. Right. I think another way of thinking about it is, um, most people don't intuitively understand how portfolio math works. Um, and, and obviously I won't get into it too much cause it's, it's boring, but I'll just share with you, you know, one observation is if you, if you take one asset class, that's got 10% annualized returns and 20% ball, and you go grab another asset class, that's got the same thing, 10% annualized returns and 20% vol. And let's say they both have 40% worst declines, you know, kind of like 2008, right? If they're the same, if one's, you know, tech stocks and the other one's software stocks, when you blend them together, your aggregate results are going to look pretty much just like each of the individual 20, 10% returns, 20% vol, 40% drawdowns. However, if they're fundamentally different, if there's no structural reason that they should make or lose money at the exact same moments in time, what ends up happening is you, you end up with a return that's higher than 10% if you blend them together, you know, how much higher? Um, it depends on, you know, the path traveled and, and your rebalancing philosophy, but generally speaking, you know, it'll be say 11 or 12%, something like that. Um, but the volatility, um, will fall from 20 down to uh, a smaller number. It won't get cut in half. There's actually a, the Pythagorean theorem. You can estimate what it is, but it's basically 0. 0.71 multiplied by well, the 20 to 14 ish volatility was. Yeah. Something like that. Um. And then your drawdowns, depending upon when they happen, uh, and there's some randomness going on, but they're just, they're a lot smaller and, and it's very counterintuitive. Um, so like some people look at the all weather program I run and they go, how do you do that? You know, it's gotta be like lots of rules and sophisticated machine learning and all this other stuff. And I say, no, all I'm doing is implementing modern portfolio theory, but actually doing it. I'm actually taking it to its natural conclusion and bringing in truly uncorrelated assets and having getting, they're forced to get married into one portfolio. So yeah, you get the, you get the bend, the returns stack up on top of each other, but the volatilities dilute and offset each other. And then the drawdowns do the same thing. They work, you know, against each other and become much smaller. It's, it's not rocket science. This is what everybody should be doing. It is counterintuitive though. And, um, I would just add that, that. I think 
for those who are still not quite tracking how this operates. Um, we, we wrote a paper called Skis and Bikes, the untold story of diversification that makes an attempt at really breaking this down to its, to its fundamental units and, and making the concept as approachable as we know how. So um, something to, to, to look up. I would also say, just to put it in context, bringing it back to the 1970s, you had stocks and bonds that were correlated and had slightly negative real rates of return. Had you included oil, commodities, gold, gold had a 24% annualized real return. Commodities had a 13% annualized real return. So those four assets, say bonds, generally have that 20% volatility. The three assets, say, let's say bonds has a 10% volatility for sake of uh, easy, easy math. If you didn't include commodities through that period, you had a highly volatile portfolio of two asset classes that happened to be correlated because it was an inflationary regime. So no benefit came from thinking about diversifying. If you had the wisdom to have some golden commodities, you had some things working in the portfolio and the yin and the yang balances off and that rebalancing occurs so that when you get out of that decade, you have a more robust portfolio return and your you have stocks and bonds, which have dragged that commodity portfolio for 10 years. But then you start 1981 and 1982 and run all the way to March 2000, where the commodity portfolio is dragging on that large equity portfolio. But again, uh, you know, if you could admit that you don't know the future, you would hold all of these asset classes, but people tend to forget history and its lessons. Yeah. And here's my hypothesis. Um, let's say that you agree with that and you attempt to bring in, you know, pure gold, um, a pure crude oil, um, position. Uh, it won't take very long, you know, two, three, four quarters for you to realize that this just quintupled your workload, your compliance workload, you know, handholding phone calls, you know, it's just, it's off the charts, right? So you will struggle as if, as a financial advisor to hold even two or 3% in pure alternatives. Um, but if you can find programs that they themselves use enough pure alternatives to make a difference, but they also have risk assets in there, then I think what you'll find is it's not hard at all to hold a 10, 15, maybe even 20% allocation to something like that. Now, if you do the simple algebra, that works out to a lot more than a two to 5% allocation in the pure halts. So some people view that as selling out. I just view it as solving actual real world problems and helping investors turn negative uh, dollar weighted returns into positive dollar weighted returns for one of you guys pointed out earlier is making it so that they can actually hold on. Yeah, I think, I mean, one of the things that we constantly say to each other is we're about maximizing realized risk adjusted returns for investors, yeah. which is to say, I think like you, Eric, that we're, we're suggesting that part of our responsibility is to help the investor realize those returns via the avenues with which we offer them. That takes courage um, and work and it should make a huge difference. You should get rewarded very handsomely for that if you truly like commit to it and stick with it because not very many people are doing it. Agreed. So I've got, I've got a kind of a fun question as we, I think we're coming, you know, we've been talking for just over an hour, but I wondered if there was any kind of fun conversations that you've had with Tom Basso or any interactions that have been kind of highlights as you've been the building standpoint. I know that, as you mentioned, he's on the board with you and I know you've had multiple conversations with him as you sort of put standpoint together and grown it. So he's quite a personality in the investment field. And I just wondered if there was any anecdotes or fun stories you could share with us. I'm sure how many of them I can share publicly. <laughs> um, <laughs> how many publicly shareable fun stories? Yeah, uh, Tom, <laughs> PG rate. Tom's, Tom's a wonderful human being. I love that guy. I, uh, I knew he was a winner when I first, did I just tell you guys a story that I applied for a job at his firm Trendstat back in 99 and he rejected me. He sent me a rejection letter and um, that letter, it was like two pages long and it was everything about, you know, excitement and how, you know, curve fitting and, you know, fooling yourself. And he just went through all this stuff because he looked at my resume and he saw this financial engineering, a trade station and programming and stuff. And he just, he assumed and rightfully so that I was out there building curve fit trading systems, you know, as a kid back then. Right. So. 
but that letter became the template for, um, or the foundation for some really good habits going forward. So I'm just thrilled to actually have him on the team now. Um, I guess the, my, my interaction with Tom, you know, about half of it is he, he's traveling all the time. You know, he's in Costa Rica or he's in Ireland or he's in France or Italy or wherever. So he's basically just showing me my, what my life can be like. Um, if standpoint's successful and I get to retire the way he did recently, um, you know, with just the guy is happy, you know, he has exactly the life that he wants and he lives, lives it to the fullest. Um, what people don't understand about me is so do I, you know, I love the crushing responsibility of managing other people's money. Um, it bothers me not at all to, to, to have no holidays other than new year's cause you know, we're trading six days a week, 24 hours a day, and we have to be available. Um, so yeah, no, no crazy stories. It's just all good stuff. He's a, he's a pleasure to work with. Everyone on my team is a pleasure to work. We all self-selected in, including Tom, um, the, the whole board of directors, everyone is just works well together. So we, in fact, we don't even have a CEO at this company. That's decisions get made as a team and a group. And it was structured that way you know, intentionally. So. Um, no, Tom's one of the good guys, uh, no crazy stories other than, you know, he travels the globe with his lovely wife and they just have fun all the time. And then they come back for board meetings and he still imparts wisdom upon me. Uh, he still trades. Um, you know, he doesn't manage other people's money. He does his own money. So, you know, we swap stories and research and whatnot. So, but I have no complaints. Tom's a winner. Yeah. Well, the, the letter, the, the letter is a great story. If you still have a copy, that would be something that. Maybe with Tom's permission, you could post it on, uh, on standpoint for those aspiring quants out there. I think that would be great. I would certainly read it. That's yeah, he and I have both been, really we've been looking for it for a couple months now. Um, I'm still well, hopeful that I can find it. I know it's somewhere. It's just, I've moved a few times and I don't know where it is. Um, but yeah, maybe, maybe reapply. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so funny. And out of all, I sent out like 400 resumes in 99 and I got three responses. One was Tom Bass. So it was the only one that was, wasn't just a boilerplate, you know, thanks, but no thanks. It was actually two pages of really good advice. So that tells you what kind of person he is. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. I think I was listening to uh, Tom was on an RCM or something like that. He was talking about a couple of conversations that he had had with uh, yourself on the uh, RCM alternatives, or was it you? I can't remember who one of you. Um, actually, I think it was Tom. Anyway, worthwhile listen if you if you weren't aware of that. Yeah, he's been on. Um, he's constantly getting requests that he podcasts these days. Um, he's written a lot of books. There's a whole bunch of books out there um, that are pretty good too. You know, like I understand mm -hmm. position sizing, um, so I'm not highly motivated to go buy a book called How to Size Your Positions, but <laughs> I did it anyway. So I read it and I'm like, wow, this is actually. This is really helpful. It's straight to the point and it's, it's actually, uh, moves the needle for people that are beginning to learn how to trade. I think that book's 10 bucks and there's like millions of dollars of wisdom yeah. in it. Yeah. <laughs> so I uh, definitely a recommend. Yeah. All right. Uh, Pierre, you want to, uh, wrap us up with the final yeah. question of the day? Yeah. Yeah. This wouldn't be raise your average if we didn't ask. The would you rather question at the end? I'm curious as to how Eric's going to uh, think about this. Yeah. Would you rather spend a week in the past or a week in the future? Yeah. Then it's funny. I listened to several of your podcasts and you always ask that and I was not even prepared. Uh, I definitely would not want to go into the future because I feel like it would corrupt um, my progress into the future. So I, well, maybe to just see what the world looks like, <laughs> you know, just a, just a peak, like, is it like a smoldering, you know, uh, rubble or dystopian and yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> um, going into the past, um, well, part of, you know, this actually scares me. I mean, what I wanted to say is I'd like to go back and give myself some advice. Um, but I definitely wouldn't have listened to myself. Um. That's the yeah. Point. And I'm not sure I want to change how things played out. You know, I don't, I wouldn't want to be, you guys ever think about how radically different your life could be if you turned left on Tuesday in 1984, instead of right that day, like you two wouldn't even know each other. Yeah. Right. So, wouldn't be married to my wife would have different so, kids, you know, 
or no kids. I've had a lot of broken <laughs> bones. I've got a pinched nerve, you know, I, not as skinny as I'd like to. I got all kinds of things to complain about, but I wouldn't change anything. And I wouldn't change anything because I think it would well, change everything. It's funny, isn't it? When you, if you actually stop and think about what inspired you to do something that you could actually, you could actually trace it back into your memory, exactly where the moment was where your mind got changed or this idea, you know, sort of germinated, right. That, that made you do something and, and, or think a different way. And, and it's amazing how, how just that, that moment in time, you know, you could have been interrupted at that moment. Somebody could have just stepped into your office or, 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 you know, honked their horn <laughs> right at that, the exact wrong moment. And you would have lost that just like, you know, when you try to remember a dream. That's a good way of saying it. So has anyone ever just declined to answer this question? Now they usually go through some sort of machination like you're going through and then finally say, I don't know. <laughs> How did you guys answer? In future, past. I, I, I find myself circling the, the drain just like you. Oh, past. Oh, wait a second. No, I don't want to change anything. Oh, future. Oh, that's going to inevitably change anything. It ends up being a turtles all the way down. And you know, plus I don't want to get in trouble with the time variance authority now that I've found out about a Loki <laughs> series with Marvel. So I, 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 you know, I think time travel is something we should be very careful of. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> what about you, Adam? Yeah, I don't know. I'd have to give it some thought. Um, yeah, uh, pro probably future, but only to observe, not to interact. Yeah. So that was my answer too. It's like, I don't want to want to go back. I don't want to see what happens to me. I just kind of want to see, you know, is global warming real? Um, I, that's what I'd like to see. When do we travel out <laughs> among the stars? Oh, do, do we make it past the technological singularity? Like there's, there's lots of interesting things to go forward and see, but wouldn't be that. I think I wouldn't want the sports almanac so I could come back and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Inevitably, we always end up at Back to the Future. Yes, that's true. When I was thinking that when I was 10, and I, I understand from the uh, psychological literature that your life peaks at 10. Your, your perception of life happiness peaks at 10. <laughs> Everything that happened when you're 10 is the best thing that ever could happen ever, right? So uh, that's why. Well, Adam, what, what do you think? That's so true. What do you think <laughs> um, kids should do? before they hit 10 that you didn't do? Like my answer to that is learn programming because it is so hard to learn programming after your brain shuts off, you know, or learn a new language like French or something like that. So what would be, what would your answer be? Well, language I think is different than programming. Um, but I think learn, learn, learn as many languages as possible would absolutely be, be up there. Um, but I mean, this really relates more to your perception of when the world peaked, right? When, when was, when you say the good old days, what? the good old days are whenever you were 10, right? And that's true. No, no matter how, how, <laughs> or know. what age you are, like the good old days. World War II. That was the good old days. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, that's a good question. But learning other languages, sir. I wonder, I wonder if somebody should actually, you know, have a word with all the great five teachers, you know, they would have something to say about that. I'm sure. Or yeah, quite right. Too good. Well, Eric, thank you so much. That's been, uh, it's been a great discussion and very, uh, enlightening. Thank you so much for your time today. And thanks Eric. You bet. My, my pleasure. Thanks guys. Appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. Yeah.